let's get down to business. Thanks for coming out tonight. I wrote me a manual, a step-by-step booklet for you to get. Oh, I make money moves. You can't see me, my time is now What up, what up, what up guys Welcome back to the Fitness Times Business Podcast The show created to provide you with the practical and strategic advice To help you level up in fitness, business, your career, your relationships and your life My name is Joseph Medsell, I am your host I'm joined in another installment of our Your Four segment by co-host Caleb Hey mate, it's good to be back It's good to be back, episode number 10 of Your Four yeah, excited man! Double digits. Well, eh? Yeah, I was going to say. Now yeah. we're now we're now we're big boys. We're playing. Yeah. We're playing in the big leagues now. Yeah. Uh, Caleb, we've got uh, four interesting questions uh, to dive into today that that uh, cover um, pursuing passion. We've got some relationship questions in there. We've got some personal development questions. We've got business questions. A whole range. Uh, before we get stuck in, how can the listeners and the viewers send their questions in if they've got one that they want us to answer? So they can send them through to me at Instagram at caleb.feget, C-A-L-E-B dot F-I-E-G-E-R-T. They can also hit you up and send them to you via Instagram as well, but you're just going to screenshot them as you always do and send them to me. The most efficient way, go straight to the man that collates the questions. (laughs) Uh, And guys, just a reminder, all questions are anonymous, so we we will never attach your name or your Instagram handle or anything to um, any questions that you may ask. So you can really be as open and honest and as vulnerable as you want to be when it comes to sending in your four questions. The more open, the more honest, the more vulnerable, uh, typically the better the questions are uh, and therefore the better the episodes are because we're able to go deep and give you guys some practical and strategic advice. Caleb, let's dive in, man. Question number one. All right, number one. I am currently at a point where I want to quit my job and follow my passion, but I don't yet really know what truly excites me. I want to leverage my full-time job and build something on the side, but I just don't know what that something is or how to find it. Can you guys offer any practical advice on how to find out what that thing is? The wanting to do it is there. I just don't know exactly what to do. Yeah, look, I mean... The main driver here is obviously this person wants to quit their job, right? <laughs> there's, a bit, there's a bit of job di- dissatisfaction because, you know, they're saying, I want to quit my job and follow my passion, but then I want to, you know, leverage my full time job and build something on the side. First things first, that is the right strategy. The right strategy, you know, I, I see so often people go, you know what, I'm, I'm going to pursue my passion and they kind of drop everything regardless of their personal responsibilities. And they're just like, you know, I'm going all in on my passion, um, which is just dumb. Uh, the better way, the best way, the only way to make it work is to make sure that you're servicing your responsibilities and then work on your passion on the side. You know, turn a a little hobby into a passion and then allow that to kind of be nurtured and cultivate that on the side. And then when it gets to a level where, you know, you're able to make the transition, that's when you make the transition. So I think first and foremost, don't, don't, you know, completely close the door of your full-time job just because you want to quote unquote pursue your passion um, in some fucking idealistic meaning of the word. Um, So far as finding out what that thing is, I like to use the analogy, Caleb, of tasting food. Okay. Yeah. Right. And the the, the analogy goes like this. You don't know what food you're going to like and dislike if you don't go and taste the food. Right, and the more food that you taste, the more chances you're going to find stuff that you really, really like, right? And then you're also going to find stuff that you don't particularly like. So when it comes to finding a passion, it's about tasting as many different things as you possibly can until you find that thing that just clicks. And when you find it, you'll know it. And you have firsthand experience with this. You're a passionate guy. You've yes. got, you got shit that fucking <laughs> lights you up like. Yeah, a spotlight. Yes, absolutely, man. Um, and that's kind of like what, you know, how I view passion. You know what I mean? And like, I, I do believe like deep down, we actually know what our passion is. And, and you know, that passion is that thing that truly excites us. And I've been looking into a little bit about that kind of thing because my passion, as I've mentioned before in previous podcasts, is in music, is in playing guitar. Um, but I also kind of look at why haven't I pursued that in some points too? Yeah. Um, and when I've looked at that, sometimes it's because that passion is the most thing that's dearest to our heart. And sometimes we're afraid to pursue that passion so much because what happens if we fail that passion? We actually go to ourselves and we go, man, 
if I failed that passion, I don't know how I'd be able to survive that. And sometimes we go off and we go and we taste other things as what you've spoken about. Um, and I've seen that in my life. So I've seen that in the fruits of my life. So I've tasted some things and they've tasted good, but nothing is tasted as good as like my music and that like, I'm like, man, that sets my soul on fire. That sets me alight. Um, and this is important to segue into, I know we were probably going to touch base on this in one of the other questions, which is very interesting, but it's important to have like, a really good friendship circle around you when it comes to your passions as well. Like I take advice from what you say, you know, go and pursue your passions, but don't just drop everything for your passions. But be very mindful of the people that you keep around yourself as well. Because I had a friend the other day who spoke to me and he said, Caleb, what do you think you're going to pursue in life? And I said, oh, you know, I'm feeling music. And he went, he stopped me right there. And he said, no, Caleb, don't, well, I'm feeling this. Just straight up tell me what it is you're going to pursue. And I said, music. And he said, that's it. That's right. He goes, that's your passion. That's what you're going to have to run with. So I guess that would be sort of my advice to be like, hey, you know, like if there's something inside you that you're feeling like, mm, yeah, I want to, you know, actually pursue that. No, turn it around. Make sure that you 100% drive in, go for it. Don't just drop everything, but have that mindset that you would be willing to drop everything when the right time comes. And I think that's really important, man. For, for me and my journey, when I stumbled across my passion, right, which was, I guess, really the, it's kind of almost difficult to describe my passion, really. <laughs> it's kind of, it's the delta of um, fitness and business, right? Yeah, it's yeah. the name of this fucking <laughs> podcast. But when I came across that, you know, as a, I was a, in my late teens at the time and, you know, I was in, I'd, I'd been bodybuilding, I'd been competing in bodybuilding, taking supplements. I had the business thing and the two things kind of came together and I was like, fuck, like this is, you know, at the time it was starting a supplement company. Now it's evolved into something much bigger than that. But at the time it was the intersection of, of fitness and business. And that was what, you know, it's the first thing I thought about in the morning. The last thing I thought about at night. It's what kept me awake at night. It's yeah. what got me up out of bed in the morning when my alarm didn't go off. That was, you know, set my soul on fire. You know the feel. Yeah, oh yeah. Right? <laughs> and I knew it. But at the time, I was studying at university, right? I was studying uh, mechanical engineering and I was studying law. I was also working at an oil and gas company at the time, right? I had these responsibilities. I had these commitments so I let my passion just kind of do its thing on the side, right? And I was, it was, it was like a hobby passion. It was what I would do, you know, uh, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. I'm at uni or I'm working. And then from 6 p.m. to midnight, that's my passion time, right? And that was my investment. That was my, let me just kind of work on this on the side until it gets to a point where it makes sense, you know, and when it made sense for me was I'd finished my studies, right? I'd built the business to a point where it was, I, I could uh, pull enough money from it to survive. And then I was like, okay, well, now I can close the door on the job that I had at the time in the oil and gas industry. I'd finished my studies and I was like, okay, now this is, like you mentioned, this is the time to go all in. And, and that's when I did it is I went all in. So, you know, it's really important to, to allow the passion to to grow and to um and and to be cultivated on the side uh, while you're servicing all of your other bits and pieces. The last thing I want to say with regards to this is you don't have to turn your passion into a business. I actually had a question about this in my um, weekend Q and A on Instagram the past weekend. Is um, the question was something along the lines of. Uh, I've, I've found my passion. How do I go about turning it into a business? And I said, you, just because you found your passion, you, you found that thing that sets your soul on fire. It doesn't mean that that needs to be a business, right? You can have a, a, another business or you can have a job or you can have a career that does what it needs to do to allow you to live the life you want to live and meet all your financial responsibilities and whatnot. And then you can have your passion on the side, yeah. which is just what you really enjoy doing in your spare time. You know, I think that there's, you know, and I've, I've probably been guilty of this in, in content in the past of saying, you know, pursue your passion, turn yeah. it into a business, <laughs> make sure yeah, that you yeah. don't work a day in your life. You know, all those cliche sayings, but the truth is you don't have to do that with your passion. You can have a passion that is just a passion and stays a hobby and is just something that you really enjoy doing in your spare time. And then parallel to that, you can have your career or your business or whatever else it is. 
So I guess like my kind of question, because what I notice about with my passion, for example, is that as soon as I kind of discovered, hey, this is my passion, I want to pursue in my li- pursue this in my life, I noticed that a lot of opposition came my way in terms of a lot of people said, why would you want to do that? That's not going to get you anything and so forth. And I even noticed that from like, unfortunately, from you, 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 we spoke about this even last podcast episode that sometimes it sort of comes from the people that are closest into us, like our family and stuff or, or close friends. What was that like for you when, you know, you were studying and when you were working and when you were going to pursue Massive Joes, did you come up against that and how did you deal with that? Yes. Yeah, uh, I came up against it a lot. It's other people's limiting beliefs, right? It's other people projecting their their limitations and what they believe is possible and not possible onto you, uh, which has nothing to do with you, right? It, it, you you got to understand that that's other people projecting their own limitations onto you, right? You yes. don't you don't have yeah. to try and change their mind. It 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 is what it is. I came up against it a lot. You'll find this quite interesting, Caleb. I still come up against it. I was going to say it doesn't stop. <laughs> I still have it, right? Like yeah. I still, I still. One of my, <laughs> one of my, <laughs> one of the funniest things that happens these days, right? And this happened a couple of weeks ago. Is I'll see people who I haven't seen for, you know, like ten years, right? And um, and you know, they'll say, you know, how's that? How's that little supplement business going? <laughs> and shit like that. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. is that all you're doing? Are you doing anything else? I'm like, yeah, motherfucker, I actually am. I run a supplement company. I run an apparel company. I run a fucking media company. I'm doing mentoring. But they say it in a way that it's like, oh, is that, you know, you're still just doing that little hobby thing on the side. Um, so, yes, when I made the decision to, to go full in, go, you know, hundred percent deep dive into that. Yes, I did face other people's limiting beliefs and I still face them today. Um, the way that I deal with them is I understand them for what they are. And most of the time, particularly when they're coming from people who are closest to you, whose opinions you give weight to, right? So it could yeah. be parents, it could be siblings, it could be grandparents, you know, yeah, those yeah. people who you're like, you know what, you mean a lot to me and, and therefore your opinion means a lot to me is you need to understand it for what it is. You need to appreciate it for what it is, which is what they have and haven't been able to achieve in their life. They're trying to project that onto you. And you can believe it or you can not believe it. It's your choice. I chose not to believe it. I still choose not to believe it. Even now when I tell people what I'm planning on doing in the next five years, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, I don't give a fuck if they think it's possible or not possible. That's on me to be the to be the the person that makes that decision. So that's how I deal with it. That's good. Good advice, man. Next question. Next question. How important is trust in a marriage? Can it be regained if lost? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> Very good question. I think um uh, look, man, I can answer this one or two ways. I can answer this with the with the um uncensored gloves off version or I can answer it in the <laughs> sugar coated version. <laughs> Listen, I don't give a fuck who you are, where you come from. When it comes to a marriage, trust is everything, right? And people may say, you know, nah, it's not that big a deal. It's not that important to me. Motherfucker, why did you get married in the first place? You know, like when it comes to marriage, this question is about marriage. Trust is everything. So how important is it? It's probably the most important. And you can fluff around the edges, Caleb, and you can say, you know, different people have different love languages and this and that, whatever. It's all bullshit, right? Trust is the most important thing in a marriage. When it comes to other relationships, right? Friendships, personal relationships, business partnerships, different different person-to-person relationships, trust may not be the most important thing, right? Depending on the dynamic of the relationship, it might sit number two, number three, whatever. But when it comes to marriage, it's the most important thing. You agree or disagree? I agree. Good. I agree. <laughs> I was hoping you would. <laughs> um, can it be regained if lost? I think this one depends on how, to what degree has it been broken? Because there are fatal breaks in trust. Right. And when it comes to a marriage, you know, a fatal break in trust might be 
uh, being unfaithful to your partner. I think most people would agree that that's, that's, that's a, you know, that's a line in the sand. Um, it might be, you know, relating to shared finances and somebody does something to hurt the other party with regards to shared finances or something like that. There are definite lines in the sand where it's like that is a fatal break in trust and that probably can't be repaired. You might talk yourself into it being able to be repaired, but the truth of the matter is you're probably talking yourself into it because you have significant sunk costs in the relationship at that point. Perhaps you've given up 10 years of your life with this person, 20 years of this life of your life with this person. You've invested so much time and effort and energy, and you're trying to get a return on those sunk costs. It's not going to happen, right? If the trust is fatally broken, it's not coming back. You need to just accept it for what it is and move on. The other version of trust being broken is the death by a thousand cuts trust, right? And so these are the little things where you make promises to your partner and you, you let them slide. You know, you don't keep them. Maybe it's like, you know what, I'll, I'll um, pick you up from work at this particular time and you show up an hour late. Or, you know what, I'm going to make you um, dinner on this particular night during the week and you forget about it. You know, these little, not fatal breaks in trust, but little, you let them slide. You let them slide. You let them slide. First piece of advice, if that's happening right now, put a stop to it, right? Because death by a thousand cuts is a very real thing. If you can stop it at cut number one or two, it's going to be much easier to reverse it than if you're trying to stop it at cut a thousand. Often those small, if you catch them early enough, those small slides in trust can be repaired. Takes work, but they can be repaired. I think like for me with, with trust, I agree with you. Um, and I look at it trust as like it's the very foundation of that marriage. Yeah. Um, and when I'm just stepping into a new relationship, the first very thing that I, I wanted to do was set some boundaries in place. Like, hey, you know, these are our boundaries. And as you, it's, it's very interesting, you were talking about drawing a line in the sand. We essentially already draw a line in the sand about our personal values and our belief systems and so forth. And we go, okay, if one of us crosses that, we break trust. And then I would, I, and, and I very firmly said, if one of us crosses those boundaries, we don't get married. Um, because that's the foundation of trust. And I look at it, it's very important. So, you know, if I've put this boundary in place and I say, hey, look, I'm not going to cross this boundary. This is the boundary we've agreed upon. And I cross it, even if, if, if it's a boundary and it, it feels acceptable to cross it at some point. Well, I'm not going to talk about the boundaries I've put in place. Um, they're not boundaries of unfaithfulness or things like that. Um, if I cross that boundary and we get later on in the relationship and something tough comes up, you know what I mean? We all go through all kinds of different trials in life, you know? So if something tough comes up and I say, hey, I've got this, it's all good, we've got this, subconsciously in the back of their mind, they're going to know that I cross boundaries and they're going to be like, are you sure you got this? Mm -hmm. They might not even consciously, but there'll be something in them and that's the, you know, distrust. And so that's why I think it's so important that trust is the foundation um, because you build upon that foundation afterwards that you shouldn't even need to necessarily go through those 1,000 cuts because if you've built such a solid foundation of trust, they're going to be like, hey, this person's made me dinner. I'm going to do it. You know, I know they're going to do it at that time. And also because us as well, being obedient and responsive as well to what we've already promised, saying, all right, these are boundaries, we're not going to cross them. It's going to make it easier for us to remember also, hey, I promised them I was going to make them dinner at this time, going to go ahead and do it without even letting it slide in the first place. Yeah. And that's, it's, you know, it actually crosses over into how you build personal confidence, right? At its very basic level, building confidence in yourself is about trusting yourself, which is about making promises to yourself and keeping them. That's, you know, trust is, it's such an important internal concept as, you know, just, just with yourself. And it's such an important personal relationship concept with other people, right? As soon as trust is broken, man, like it, it, the, the whole dynamic, you think about yourself, right? As soon as you make a promise to yourself you, that you yeah, don't keep, yeah. how do you feel? You feel fucking shit. Right? How do you feel when when somebody makes a promise to you that they don't keep, however big or small? 
right? You might let it slide once. Oh, yeah, cool. You know, I'm, li- I'm literally having this right now. Before I jumped into this podcast, I'm emailing a person who I'm relying on for some business bits and pieces yeah. Yeah. who I'm like, you know, you've canceled on me once. I'm supposed to meet you tomorrow. Are you can- like, I'm already questioning the trust, right? It's such an important concept. And when it comes to marriage, it's everything, man. Absolutely. Next question. Next question. How do you take on information from books when you have a lot going on from work, et cetera? Uh, quite, quite easily. Um, there's a couple of, well, firstly, I, I, I've got some practical and strategic tips, things that I do to make sure that I kind of, you know, I'm present with the book that I'm reading and I'm consuming. Um, but before I go there, there's, uh, the way that you've asked this question is leaning into limiting beliefs. Right, I can tell by the person who are, who has asked this question is they're like, you can't have a lot going on at work and, and yep, take yep, information from yep, books at the yep. same time, right? So straight up, yes, you can. Let me just shoot that limiting belief right down. Uh, and there's there's a lot of people a lot busier than me that do a lot more reading than I do that are a lot smarter and able to take on information much better than I am. So I'm just a little toddler at this point. The way that I do it, is I, I do a couple of things. The first thing I do is I set myself a reading goal per week. So one of my personal goals is to read 50 pages per week. And whether I break that down into 10 pages a day or 20 pages every two days, or I don't get a chance to read during the week, so I do 25 pages on Saturday, 25 pages, whatever. My personal goal is I have to read at least 50 pages a week. The way that I read is I'll often read last thing at night. So just before I go to bed, it helps me relax. But more importantly, it's the time of day where I can, my computer's off, my phone is on sleep mode, on the charger. I, I'm not going to get any phone calls. I'm not going to get any distractions. I'm not going to get any notifications or emails or any of that shit, right? So I can go focused attention. What do I want to focus on right now? Block everything else out. And I'm focused on reading my book. The second thing that I do is a lot of people highlight books. I don't do that because um, I, I, I like to get context of what I feel like I need to go back and reread. So I'll actually fold the corner of a page yeah. of a book. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's something on a particular page that really resonates with me that I'm like, okay, I need to go back and read that again. So I'll fold the page of the corner of the page. And when I go back, I don't just read the highlighted passage because I'm not highlighting. I read the whole page. Mm -hmm. So I'll go back. Um, And what I do when I finish an entire book, so I might have a 300 page book and I might have 30 pages in there that have the little corner folded over. So when I finish the book, immediately I'll go back and I'll read those 30 pages again to make sure I'm absorbing that information that's really, really valuable. The last thing that I do is if something really, really resonates with me, I'll journal about it. I'll put it in my journal and I'll actually write about it, you know, and if it gets me thinking, I'll just allow my thoughts to flow and, and, and it goes in my journal. And that's how I find, you know, really allows me to firstly focus my attention on what I'm reading and then extract the valuable bits and pieces that resonate the most with me. Interesting. I do various some some very similar things as well. Yeah, but what do you do? I, I also highlight as well. So I would I highlight, um, but then there might be some things where sometimes I'll look back and I'll be like, I want to just reread that, mm-hmm. and I might read a whole chapter or something, or just read a verse or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and also I will, will write about it as well. Yeah. And sometimes I also like to read it out loud. That's just another thing I like mm-hmm. to do too. I like to read it out loud and and even just sort of you know um, like. I'll be open, you know, you, people might be like, oh, you speak on the podcast well and stuff. And it's like, yeah, because I do also do a little bit of talking, rehearsing at home. Like, I think like a lot of being confident in public speaking has to do with a lot of what you're doing in behind closed doors as well. If you can't confidently speak in private, yeah. it's it's actually a lot harder to speak publicly. Caleb, I've done, <laughs> I've done um, a number of keynote speeches. The most recent one is on my personal YouTube channel. I did a, a keynote speech to some school leavers last year and the speech went for an hour and I rehearsed that speech probably 10 times yeah, by myself, yeah, yeah. the full hour. Like literally, I stood wow, in front of a yeah, mirror yeah, and wow. I rehearsed the speech. And, you know, people hit me up and they go, oh, wow, you know, that, that you didn't have notes or anything. How did you remember? Motherfucker. <laughs> 
you repeat things 10 times by yourself for an hour long in front of a mirror, you tend to remember that shit. I was going to say, yeah, obviously coming from a musical background and having to practice for hours and hours, it kind of makes sense that you got to do that with anything to, to look like you're performing naturally. Um, but to get more back on what this person's kind of asking, like how do you, how do you, how do you take on information from books? You know, um, like the question that I kind of ask is, well, what are you doing when you're not working? Because this kind of person is kind of saying, oh, I'm so full on from work. Afterwards, I'm not, it doesn't seem like I've got time to read a book. But it, the reality is you have to ask yourself, well, what are you doing when you're not working? Um, and I had to ask myself that kind of question because for a long time I struggled to read. Like I'd be like, oh no, I just go home and I just want to relax, watch yeah. some TV. Psychologically do... exhausted. Yeah, yeah. I need some downtime. Yeah. Yep. 100%. <clears throat> all, all, of, all of that. Um, but then I kind of like asked myself, you know, what, 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 what actually wasn't I doing? You know what I mean? What was my environment looking like? And was it a healthy environment that could actually provide that kind of reading? Um, and then I kind of asked myself, well, you know, why am I doing everything that I'm doing as well? I got pretty deep, man. Like I'd ask myself, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? Is this actually achieving? Because if I want to read, why do I want to read? You know, what am I going to achieve from reading? And then once I can figure out that, I go, okay, so why am I doing what I'm doing now? Is this in line with why I want to read? And so, for example, I even started asking myself with all the time that I'm spending, Am I spending it wisely? I just kept di diving deeper and deeper. I said, well, if I want to be able to spend half an hour to read and I'm going to even the gym for an example, am I spending all that time at the gym wisely? Can I make up pockets of time in other areas? Make the most of your 24. Yeah, make the most of your 24. Yeah. Um, what, well, what am I doing? Oh, if I'm sitting at the doctor's, Am I just waiting for the doctor? Am I just going on the phone and scrolling on the phone? Like, could I bring a book with me and, and read that book? Just anyways, I think there's so many pockets of different time that we can do. Um, and then also I just kind of look at my life and I go, okay, so what's my life? You know, what is life giving me right now? And what are the options? What are the availabilities in terms of time? Like, you know, right now um, I work out in the retail stores. So um, I'm going all over the place all the time. So in, in partly, I have an excuse that I can't read because there's a lot of time that is kind of being spent on the road. And so recently, I've actually just gone, okay, put my ego aside for a moment and let's listen to audiobooks. I was going to ask you about audiobooks. And I know that people will, uh, I know that you personally would prefer to read, um, yeah. but I got to a point in my life where I was like, well, what happens if I never read that book because I don't have the time, but I had the opportunity to read it in a different way, but my ego got in the way of me. Mm. Maybe I should just get that information in. And I've actually been walking in an experience with that. I was like, I've been listening to this audio book right now. And the other day something came up and then the information that I'd learned from that audio book was able to help me. And I think, could you imagine maybe if I got to that book like a year or two later and going, man, I could have used that like a couple of years back. It's just the, the you know, <sighs> making sure you don't miss out. You know what I mean? I think it's really important. So, And yeah, look, I've spoken about audiobooks in the past and my, my personal opinion on them is me personally, I tend to take in more information through focused attention. So yeah. when, I'm reading, when I'm reading a book, I can't be doing anything else, right? Because I, I'm holding the book, I'm looking at the words, I'm reading the words, I can't be doing... I can't drive a car, for example, you know what I'm saying? Whereas with, because I listen to a lot of podcasts, I don't listen to audio books, I listen to podcasts, I can be doing a whole bunch of shit. You know, I, I listen, I actually listen to podcasts in the shower every morning. Oh, so I'm go. showering, I'm shaving, I'm getting ready, I got the podcast <laughs> in the background, then I'm driving, you know, I'm listening to the podcast while I'm driving to work. So, you know, the, the attention is not as focused. That being said, I can appreciate that different people consume information in different ways. And for some people, reading written word is not a good way to consume information. And they are just much more efficient at consuming information through audiobooks, yeah. right? And if that's you, listen to audiobooks. Yeah. You know, there's no absolute right and wrong. It's a personal preference type thing. So, and once again, like, you know, if you don't have a choice and, well, I mean, you've always got a choice, but if your choice is, you know, I, I, I'm really, it's not a priority for me to read written word, but I do have a lot of downtime during travel. Put an audio book on. It's better than not consuming it at all. 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like a conflict between like prioritizing time, but also making the most. Like, making the uh, most. Thinking yeah. about those, that's like two hours there, man. I can't let that be wasted. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Last question. All right. Have you ever seen a friend slash family run a business and have to sit back even if you see it going south? Yes. Uh, on a number of occasions. Um, more with friends than family. Uh, you know, I have seen family a, a couple of times. And I probably, as I'm getting older, I'll see it much more frequently. But um, friends, yeah, absolutely. Um <laughs> It's not, I mean, that's really the answer to the question. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me kind of elaborate the way that I want to elaborate with it. I will always, if I feel like I have value to provide, and if I feel like I'm seeing something that from my perspective doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and I can see um, going south, to use the, the person who asked the question's words, um, I'll always offer my opinion. Oh, uh, in a polite and respectful way, you know, I might identify something and say, um, you know, hey, um, brother or hey, sister or, you know, whoever it is. Hey, mate, um, you know, I've noticed that, th that this is kind of going in this direction. Do you want to know what I think about it? And if the invitation to provide my opinion is accepted, I will give my opinion. If it's not, I won't. Um, and that's just about, you know, with friend and family relationships, it's not kind of, you know, overstepping the boundary, yeah. right? Not giving information where it's not, it's not, um, it's not respected and it's not um, welcomed. There has been situations where I have given my advice and it hasn't been listened to and it hasn't worked out in the person's favor. And I go, well, you know, hate to be the one that told you so. I'd never say that. That's yeah. what I think in my mind. I hate to be the one that told you so, but had you listened to my advice, you would have avoided this completely and you didn't. In that situation, it's, you know, it's the old situation. It's the old story of you can take a horse to water, you can't make a drink, yeah. right? Some people, and, and this is not a bad thing either. Some people learn best through making their own mistakes. Some people are able to learn through other people's mistakes, which is what I always try and do, right? If I can learn from a mistake that someone else made, who's willing to give me advice to say, no, hold on a second, don't do that because this is how it's going to play out. I will always listen to that advice. But some people, whether it's ego, whether it's lack of confidence, whether it's too much confidence, whatever, it, whatever the cause is, they need to go through and learn their own lessons by making their own mistakes. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. So don't take it personally. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts? My thoughts, see, I got like um, a proverb that I that actually ties in very well to this, which yeah. is faithful of the wounds of a friend. Um, and there's a lot of wisdom in these proverbs. But one thing I've learned, which is true about a person who's never received guidance from another person, either that person is perfect or have never needed guided or, or guiding or correcting, or that person hasn't had anyone in his or her life willing to risk the possibility of a negative response from the, being the correctee. So since we know there's no perfect people, we, can, we know which one's true. See, no one would allow another person to unknowingly make a serious mistake like taking a wrong turn on a car trip. Um, yet sometimes we often fail to give guidance to others when they're threatening to, you know, derail their own life or their own journey in life. I believe like, you know, guidance should be given in those kind of situations. But, but very similar to what you say here, it should be, you know, gently, humbly and with love. And of course it should be asked like, hey, you know, I've noticed something here. Do you mind me kind of, you know, you know, say, let me, you know, what I, what I see. Um, and it also should be receive, received the same well. But I want to give an example because you've given me some guidance in my time. How did that plan out for you? Well. Good. Very well. What so was it? Some kind candor. Yeah. I remember when I went into the office and you given me this uh, con content manager role. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're like, Caleb, here's all the things that I want you to do. Go for it. And I was like, awesome. So I got in there, started writing all the content and everything, but putting my headphones on, yeah. getting in the zone, um, but getting a little bit too in the zone. And then one day you're just like, Caleb, I just want to have a chat to you for, for five to 10 minutes. Yeah. 
and you come to me and you go, look, man, it's great. You know, I've, I've seen the content. I've seen the fruits of your labor. It's been incredible, you know, but you're a bit distant from the office. And I've called you in as well here because I want you to look after the retail side of the store as well. And all that you really did was say, hey, I can see that you're traveling in, in a direction, but you've just taken a slightly wrong turn here. Yeah. Um, and so that was given out of, out of the love. I mean, Technically, you didn't ask if I wanted that advice. You just gave it to me, um, and which well, it's, was it's 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 a slightly different scenario to friends and family in in it, like true in, yeah in, true in the, in the workplace. Like that's my I have a responsibility to do that. That's yes. how I view it. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So slightly different, but but continue. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it was taken from me as well, gently, and and received it, and I said. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. You know, and I, I, I acknowledge straight away. I was like, that's a blind spot. I couldn't see that. Um, I thank you. And, and moving forward, I'm going to make sure that I stay on the right road. And, and what happened is what I did. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just a really good example of, I guess, what I'm trying to explain when I say we wouldn't unknowingly let a person make a serious mistake. Mm -hmm. If I had kept doing that, um, one part of the, what I was doing and what I was responsible would have been booming, but other parts would have lacked. Mm. Do you think that, this is just a thought I had as you were kind of running through that. Do you think that in the friend and family uh, relationship situation that sometimes people can see friends or family members heading down a wrong path, but they hesitate on offering advice because they're worried about how it's going to be received? I think so. Um, I think when it comes to like, especially with friendships, yeah. I, I've always wanted to be that one to be able to give someone advice um, in that loving and gentle way. Um, and sometimes I've also, you know, I've been someone who's done that before and the person was like not interested in listening and the friendship wasn't there. And I've actually identified that we didn't have that strong friendship to begin with. Yeah. And I've also been to someone who actually, actually had a business himself and he was running that business and it was, you talk about, you know, sales is vanity, profit is sanity. And he was making all the sales, but there was no profit from it. Yeah. And he was getting worn out and tired. And I just said, hey man, look, you're great at what you do. I said, you're really good, but you, you got to stop doing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he took that advice from me um, in the most loving way that I was. And he actually closed down the business and went and got back a job and actually got his life back <laughs> as a result. Um, I definitely think, you know, it is hard. We're worried that they're not going to receive it. But I think at the end of the day, as I spoke before, I would rather be the one to say, hey, I've noticed something's wrong here. And, and just give them that advice. Then, Because you think about it, that analogy that I said, if you go down and make a wrong turn mm -hmm. and that you've seen them make that wrong turn and they keep going down that wrong road and then maybe like 30 minutes later, oh, by the way, you turned down the wrong road. They're going to be like, why didn't you tell me when I, you know, turned? Like, I feel like, it also comes down to having those kind of very difficult and uncomfortable conversations with somebody yeah. that if you were able to ever see someone make that decision, you would want to be like, hey, I think maybe you should just reevaluate that decision in the most loving and kindest way possible. It would be hard, but at the end of the day, if they suffered more, if because I didn't say something, I would rather say something. And I think that's a really good place to finish, Caleb, because it, it, it is about balancing... You know what's more uncomfortable? Is it that short? Yeah. <laughs> is it that is it that short term discomfort of putting yourself in a vulnerable position where you know you're offering advice and perhaps the advice is is not well received or not welcomed, or is it going to be more uncomfortable to see somebody who you care about and and love uh, make a wrong turn and get themselves into a situation that takes them years to get back out of? You know, I, I think on the balance of discomforts, I know which way I'm leaning and that is the short-term discomfort. You know, I don't care if you're going to swear at me and scream at me and not like the advice. At least I know that, you know, I've tried to help and I've given the advice that I could and it's up to you if you take it or not. Yeah, I, I think like at the end of the day, I'm always that kind of person who's like, I want to treat people how I'd want to be treated. If I made a wrong decision like that and I was going down south, I'd want someone to pull me aside and say, hey, <laughs> which is why when you pull me in and I said, hey, man, I appreciate that because that's how I'd want to treat somebody. And I mean, I've been on the receiving end of it. I've made some silly decisions and someone's gone, hey, man, I uh, want to catch up for a coffee. And I've gone, yeah, no worries. And they've just given it to me and I've gone, 
wow, that was very hard to receive, <laughs> but but thank you. So I've been on both ends for, I guess, of, of receiving and, and giving. And I think that's why how I could speak so even boldly about it because I know what it's like. It's uncomfortable, but oh man, I'm so glad that someone did because I could have made some really bad decisions in the end. Yeah, 100%. Good place to finish. Yeah. <laughs> What a good episode. Absolutely, man. Guys, as always, if you have enjoyed listening to this episode, if you've taken value out of this episode, if you've resonated with uh, the messages that Caleb and I and the experiences that we have shared in this episode, the one thing we ask in return, guys, is that you share the show, share it person to person. Uh, one of the best ways we love to she see it shared, she it shared, uh, is to uh, take a screenshot on your favorite podcasting platform, post it in your Instagram story, tag myself, tag Caleb. We love seeing those and we like to repost as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, we thank you guys for tuning in. I thank you, Caleb, for um, collating these questions, putting them together and then providing your uh, input on the answers. Thanks, man. Guys, you could have been anywhere in the world right now, but you're here with us. We appreciate that. Until next time, we'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Fitness Times Business Podcast. We hope you enjoyed listening. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. And if you enjoyed this episode and took some value from it, make sure you share it with your friends, your family, and your followers. And if you haven't yet, be sure to leave us a five-star rating.